So thank you again for coming today, and we're welcoming our second speaker today on our Ancient Seas um, open house. Uh, this is actually the second time we've hosted Amelia, so thank you so much for coming back. She was gracious enough to give a talk at the Geology Museum a little bit ago about um, Mosasaurs again. Um, so we're very happy to have her here again. So a little bit about Amelia. She grew up, uh, she was originally from Milwaukee, Wisconsin, received her BA in biology from Carthage College in Kenosha, Wisconsin. She is currently a PhD candidate in comparative biology program at the Richard Gilder Graduate School at the American Museum of Natural History. Uh, she studies Mesozoic reptiles and her dissertation research is focused on the evolution of Mosasaurs, giant marine lizards, that lived during the end of the age of dinosaurs. So thank you, Amelia. I'll let you <laughs> talk about your very cool stuff. <laughs> all right, can you guys hear me all right? Yes. Okay, great, perfect. Um, so yeah, my name is Amelia Zietlow. I'm a PhD candidate at the American Museum of Natural History. Um, and today I'll be talking to you all about the animals that I spend a lot of time thinking about and working on. So for basically as long as people have been living alongside the bodies of water, we've been telling stories about the kinds of sea monsters that might have been lurking in the depths. Um, often these sea monsters kind of converge upon this lizard-like or snake-like body form, a sea serpent. Uh, the example that I have up here, uh, for relevant reasons, uh, is that of Jormungandr from Norse mythology. Um, these stories of sea serpents have kind of invaded pop culture and other, refer you know, pop culture, movies, music, whatever. Um, for those of you who caught the reference happening in the title here, it's based on a song from a band that has Jormungandr in the album artwork. Um, you, you also might be familiar with sea monsters from uh, learning about dinosaurs and the other animals that lived alongside them. Um, so during the time of the dinosaurs, during the Mesozoic, there were a lot of big, wet monsters, basically. Um, ranging from the long-necked plesiosaurs to dolphin-like ichthyosaurs and of course the animals that I'm going to be talking about today which are the mosasaurs. The one in Jurassic World is presumably uh, Mosasaurus itself, Mosasaurus huffmani, uh, which was very very big, grew to be about 50 feet long, um, and they lived at the very end of the age of dinosaurs. So mosasaurs went extinct with the same asteroid that killed the dinosaurs, um, but I want to talk a little bit more about their history and where they came from and how they got to be uh, literal giant sea monsters. So uh, like I said, they lived during the late Cretaceous, so unlike Mark's trilobites, they only were around for about 30 million years. Um, given that, it's kind of incredible how much they accomplished uh, evolutionarily, which we'll get back, we'll get to a little bit later. They had a global distribution, so their fossils have been found on all seven continents in both freshwater and marine sediments, mostly found in marine, but there have been a couple um, that were presumably in the rivers. Um, they lived their lives completely in the water. They were adapted to do this. Uh, they had um, flipper-like legs and a shark-like tail. They also gave live birth in the water. Um, I'll talk a little bit more about that in a bit. Um, and they are lizards. So lizards are not at all related to the other wet marine animals that you might think about when you think about prehistoric sea monsters. They are not related to plesiosaurs, neither the Loch Ness Monster long-necked ones or the short-necked, um, you know, Leoplorodon-esque ones. They're also not related to ichthyosaurs, which are the dolphin-shaped ones common in, in Europe and some parts of North America. And they are not dinosaurs. Um, so to better understand what I mean by this, I've got a, a diagram here that we talked about earlier of phylogeny of different reptiles. Um, in case you're not familiar with how to read these diagrams, basically how they work is they are small specific groups that are nested within larger more general groups so you can't leave your ancestry basically is what's happening here and we can see that ichthyosaurs are their own group um, separate from everybody else plesiosaurs we're getting there we're a little closer but they're still doing their own thing and then we've got this major split between the two kinds of reptiles that we have alive today the archosaurs and the lepidosaurs uh, archosaurs include turtles crocs and birds which include dinosaurs um, and lepidosaurs include tuatara and squamates. I don't have tuatara on here because I didn't have room, but they're very cool. There's like two species left and they live in New Zealand. Um, they look like a lizard, but they're technically, technically not. So technically lizards are this group called squamata or squamates. Within that, basically the only thing anyone agrees on about mosasaurs is that they are in this group called toxicophorans, which includes iguanas, monitor lizards, and snakes. Um, beyond that though, it gets kind of tricky. 
There are two uh, major hypotheses or uh, guesses about where within the lizard tree of life mosasaurs go. The one that I'm showing here is the one that I personally think is correct, although I will say that this is by no, ne no means solved. We don't know where they go. The other hypothesis is actually that they're related to snakes. And the reason that this is a problem is we can't study their DNA, so we can't actually know why they look the way they do. They might look the way they do, which is long and noodly, uh, because they're related to snakes. They might look long and noodly because they're living in the water. Um, and without having the actual DNA and being able to track that change through time, uh, we're left with this question of where they go. Uh, but for the purposes of this talk, we'll assume that they kind of belong in this, uh, this anguimorph group. So that's Gila monsters, anguid lizards, and uh, the varanids. Mosasaurs, like I said, are, well, I might not have said this, actually, another thing that makes them special um, among lizards specifically is that they are the largest lizards to ever live. Um, this diagram here, we've got the largest lizard that's not a snake, so snakes are technically lizards that have just lost their legs. Um, the largest non-snake lizard we have alive today are the Komodo dragons. The adult males can grow to be about 10 feet long. Next to that is a dinosaur that you all probably know about, uh, T-Rex. This one is scaled to be the size of Sue, which is one of the largest individuals. In mosasaurs, uh, they had really, really small beginnings. So the earliest mosasaur uh, animals were very uh, lizard-like, very much like a Komodo dragon, except maybe with a more flat tail. And they were teeny tiny, relatively. Uh, they were only two to three feet long, which honestly is a huge lizard today. That's like iguana-sized. Um, but for uh, purposes of this talk, that's tiny. The earliest true mosasaurs were still kind of lizardy, and they were only about five to six feet long. Again, huge. But you can see how small it is on this slide. We're going somewhere with this. Uh, the smallest true mosasaurs themselves, um, things like Clydastes here, um, range between 10 and 25 feet long. That's small, the size of a car. The medium mosasaurs are in the 30 to, foot 30 to 40 foot long range. And then we've got behemoths like Mosasaurus itself, uh, which, although it is not as big as the Jurassic World one, which I think the smallest size it ever is is like 70 feet long, these things are pushing 50, 60 feet long. They've got skulls that are six feet long. They're massive. They're bigger than T-Rex, um, any of them, not just Sue. Uh, bigger than most dinosaurs besides like the giant long neck sauropods. Um, they're very diverse um, as far as lizards go for one group of animals. They have a really uh, varied set of shapes of teeth. This is reflecting a varied uh, diet. So you've got in the middle, um, some kind of generalized railroad spike, generalist predators. These things were literally just eating anything that would move. Um, on the left, we've got a critter that is specialized to smash open hard-shelled prey items. So uh, they've got these big, horrible bubble teeth. And then on the right is a relatively new, uh, newly described species that has like a saw blade kind of situation where the teeth are really flat, they're serrated, and they're really uh, strongly curved like a lot of sharks. Um, so it's possible that these guys maybe like sharks that have this kind of dentition were, were scavenging and kind of ripping large pieces off of larger animals that had already died. The two in the middle might look similar, but they're actually not. So the secret here is the one on top, uh, Prognathodon, you can't actually see it because of the scale of this picture, um, but that tooth has a bit of a coarse texture to it, and it has really high ridges on both sides, and those ridges are serrated like a steak knife. The other thing that's going on with the prognathodon is it has these really deep depressions in the back of its jaw. The ear bone at the back, which I guess I can use the laser pointer that I turned on, um, this here has kind of, in other mosasaurs, it's like a question mark shape. Prognathodon, it kind of loops all the way around. So what's happening there is that prognathodon has, oh, I forgot I added this guy. So there's that loopy bone there, and there's this huge surface for jaw muscles on the back of the jaw there. Um, Prognathodon is using that to commit crime. Uh, so this is a specimen that I talked about last year, um, if you were at that talk, but now I can actually show it because it was published. This is a Prognathodon skeleton from Angola that contains not one, not two, but three skulls of other mosasaurs, including one of the same species inside of it. So there's one there, one there, one there. Two of these are new species, the other one's cannibalism. Um, this is not the only instance that we have in the fossil record of these animals being horrific to each other. Um, there are plenty of examples of the specimens that have been chomped on by other mosasaurs. This one here is um, a Tylosaurus from Kansas that has uh, all those little blue circles are bite marks and gouges. And the other thing about this specimen is the last blue circle up there here uh, is a broken neck. And this is a gorgeous specimen. You'd think 
the rest of it would be there. It's not. It probably had its head ripped off, uh, which, you know, if we think about, remember, these things are lizards. They're probably related to things like monitor lizards, and they fight all the time. These are not, they're not social in the way that we would think about as being social. They're very antisocial, but that in itself is a kind of social behavior. Um, but they, they fight for territory, for mates, because they're, they hate each other. They're, you know, that's just what they do. Um, they bite each other's heads, too, all the time, <laughs> you know. So this is kind of the, the advantage of, ha of working on an extinct animal that has really close living relatives um, is that we can actually have this handle on perhaps what, the, what their motivations for, for this behavior were. So um, to back up, or I guess zoom in a bit, um, this is what the Mosasaur family tree looks like. Like I said, they're a very diverse group. Um, I will primarily be talking about three of these groups, which I'll get to. I just want to point out that I will not talk about halosaurines because they're a nightmare. Um, they are a weirdo little group that we don't know a lot about just because they're rare to find and they're in locations that don't have as much fossil collection. Um, so this, this will be relevant a little bit later. Uh, most of the specimen, most of what I'm going to talk about and what I'm going to focus in on are the mosasaurines, which we can see here. I'll point these out again later. Um, there's an example of one here uh, because we're going to focus a little bit on Mosasaurus itself here. So let's go back all the way to um, the origin of Mosasaurs as a group. Um, and that was about 100 million years ago. We have these tiny little fossils of Aegialosaurs. So these are the little, guy, little leggy guys that I was talking about before. And they would have looked something like that. Um, there are two really good fossils of these guys that we have. There's a couple more, but these are the ones that I've, I've visited personally in Europe. This is um, the first one, Aegialosaurus dalmaticus, um, and the other one is Opediosaurus. Um, some folks think this is also Aegialosaurus, um, but you know, gender are fake, so it doesn't matter. Uh, the point is that they are most, they're most closely related to each other. They are found in Croatia, and they lived about 95, give or take, million years ago. Um, the Earth looked very different back then. There was a lot more water, and that's why Croatia was underwater at the time, and these things were uh, living there. Um, they're relatively small. All things again, all things considered, they're under five feet long, which huge for a lizard today, small for mosasaurs. Um, so these are technically what we call mosasauroids. So they are not true mosasaurs. The reason for that is their limbs. So they still have very lizard-like limbs. Um, they're still probably able to crawl around on land if they want to because they have um, hips that are actually attached to the spine like ours, so they can actually support um, their weight on land. And that's kind of the situation that regular lizards have as well. Mosasaurs proper, the mosasaurids, on the other hand, have a different thing going on. They've got flippers that basically look like whale flippers. I've, and as Mark talked about earlier, there's that you can see that pattern of homology that we, that's how we know these animals are ultimately related on some level because the same bones are making up the hands in the same way in all these different animals. Um, and then on the right there, I've got a picture of what I mean by the bones aren't, the hips aren't attached to the spine. They're just, they're not just loose, um, but they're only attached with ligaments and muscles and soft tissues. They don't have a sacrum, they just have vertebrae. Um, <laughs> and the limb bones themselves, the pelvis itself is these three bones here. And as you can see, they are loose. Uh, that's why they were able to kind of disassociate. Um, and this is part of the reason that we know these things were giving live birth, which is super cool. Uh, because since they are reptiles, their eggs cannot breathe underwater. They're not like fish and frogs, which have like a special jelly membrane that functions like a gill. These are reptile eggs. They need to be laid on land. And so that's why sea snakes today, uh, which are the only fully marine uh, lizards that we have, the ones that lay eggs have to crawl up into like little caves and lay their eggs in a dry environment. Um, the other ones give live birth, uh, like mosasaurs do. Um, that might sound odd or might be surprising, but it's actually pretty common among lizards today to give live birth. Uh, so we know that, again, based on both the fact that the hips are not attached to the spine with a bony connection, um, and because we have an agialosaur that actually has little embryos inside of it. So this is Carsosaurus. Um, so we know from that fossil that this is actually something that evolved before the hips even detach from the spine. Um, so pretty cool. So um, to come back to the question of what is a mosasaur proper, um, in my opinion, it's these guys here. So we're starting at the mosasaurids. So these are 
before we get complicated, the ones that have flippers, basically. So when you think of Mosasaurus, that, basically. If they look like that, that's probably what it is. But there's a problem with this. It's never so easy. How many times did they actually evolve? How many are there actually? For a long time, we thought that this was the situation, that some hypothetical lizard ancestor became a hypothetical egg yalosaur, so it's still kind of lizardy. That turned into a proto-mosasaur, and the proto-mosasaur diversified into the different groups that we have today. To highlight those groups again, there are two main groups, the mosasaurines and the russellosaurines. Within the russellosaurines, we actually have two more groups, plyoplatycarpines and the tylosaurines. Again, we're not going to talk about halosaurines, uh, but they're up there, and it's possible that they, the reason we're not talking about them is because they may or may not belong to one of these groups. They might be their own thing. We don't really know. Everybody's analysis gets them somewhere else. I got it in two different places literally last night in my own analysis. So who knows? Um, <laughs> but for the other guys, uh, there's a couple of quick and dirty ways to tell them apart. The easiest one is by looking at the snout. If they have a big honking rostrum, it's called, uh, which is an extension of bone beyond the teeth. If it looks like a doorknob, it's a tylosaurine, so it's really long um, and thick. If they're completely missing that rostrum and the teeth are going all the way up to the end of the snout like they do in a normal lizard, it's a plyoplatycarpine. Um, and if they have a stumpy little pointy rostrum, it's a mosasaurine. Some other regions of the anatomy that we can look at include the flippers. So tylosaurines are made of rubber. They don't like to ossify anything because why would you? Um, so these are the ones that the hips are like really loose. We don't ever find them uh, sutured together. Um, they almost never have bony carpals and tarsals, so wrist and ankle bones. Um, you can see there's like one or two in there. They still had those other structures, but they were cartilage when they were alive. The plyoplatycarpines have an intermediate amount of ossification or bone in the wrists, and the mosasaurines have the normal configuration of ossifying all of their carpals. Um, this probably has some implications for how they were swimming. These animals are probably swimming very differently and using their flippers in different ways. Um, that is a biomechanical question. That's not my area of expertise, but it is something that I would be interested in pursuing in the future. Um, but so getting back to this, the question we have as, a paleontolo as paleontologists is, are these animals different because they diversified after uh, evolving kind of a, a starting point? or did these structures originate in different ways? So we're gonna look at this on the, focusing on the flippers specifically because this is relevant to how these animals were engaging with the water when they were alive. So not only is there variation between these major groups, which we know are different based on other regions of the anatomy, but there's also quite a bit of variation within some of them, especially the purple ones, the mosasaurines, which is what we're focusing on today. And the reason this is a problem is because lizards are no strangers to being dumb and not following rules and doing whatever they want with their legs. These are all independent losses of legs in lizards. We know snakes as the, you know, kind of the hallmark legless lizard, but there are actually tons and tons and tons of different groups of lizards that have independently lost their legs. Um, the little skink there is just, that's just a cute picture that I found. There is a skink that does completely lose its legs. Um, so ignore, ignore that little thing. But it is very cute. But there, the other one was not photographed as well. So um, now mosasaurs have not lost or, well, they've reduced their legs, right? So they haven't lost their legs, but they've reduced them. They've certainly tampered with them. That doesn't look like an arm, you know? You've got an extension of the digits, which in some cases is, a, is an actual lengthening of the finger bones. In other cases, like in this case, they've done the horrible thing, which is just keep tacking on bones, keep making it longer. Um, approach, approaching like a fish flipper, basically. Um, uh, they've also kind of stumpified their humerus and their radius and their ulna. Um, and everything is true for the hind flippers as well. We're just focusing on the, the forelimbs for now. Um, they've stumpified their humerus to the extent where it's wider than it is tall, which is horrific. Um, but basically what they're doing is they're making a flipper. They're making a control surface for them to use while swimming in the water. So let's come back to this diversity using, under this new lens of lizards don't like to be simple. We have this problem in modern lizard um, systematics or the study of how lizards are related to each other. Before we were able to use DNA to figure out their relationships, it was a nightmare. It still is kind of a nightmare because there are so many lizards that have tampered with their legs 
that the algorithms that we use to recover these relationships, in a sense, get confused because it's hard to tell whether the similarities of the anatomy that we're seeing, in this case, the loss of legs, is because they're related to each other or because they're converging on the similar body plan. And before we had DNA where you can trace other lines of evidence, it was really hard to figure it out because a lot of these things have messed with their skulls as well. So it's still hypothetically possible that this is what happened. But now with this understanding, it's possible that we actually have something worse happening, which is that Mosasaurs evolved multiple times within this one group. So I am not saying that Mosasaurs are separate kinds of lizards that have converged on a Mosasaur shape and that they're not a real group. They are. We know they share an ancestor. We know that they started out as some kind of base Agiallosaur looking thing. The catch is, did that Agiallosaur diversify into other Agiallosauri things with legs? And then those independently converged on sea monster. It turns out that's probably what happened because lizards. So it's likely at least three times that these things evolved flippers and huge body size because all three of those groups independently get to be 40, 50 feet long. All three of those groups have flippers that are fundamentally different in shape and function. And more importantly, we have those fossils. So we know that we had leggy plyoplatycarpines and leggy mosasaurians. So if we plot that all out on the tree, so we, the cool thing about these trees is you can use this to trace changes in anatomy through time and, through, and get a sense of when these structures evolved and the direction that they've evolved in. So if we follow the anatomy, what we get is an origin of flippers in the Mosasaurians, which then later diversified into these because we've got a leggy purple guy, so they must have had a leggy ancestor. So basically what this is representing is that even though this guy has legs, it has other anatomy and other parts of the body that tell us that it has to belong to this purple group, even though it has legs. We've got two leggy little plyoplatycarpines. So that means that they must have had a leggy origin. We do not yet have a leggy tylosaur fossil, but because these two share an ancestor that they don't share with mosasaurs, we know that that ancestor must have also been leggy. And that flippers arose at least three times. This is why we're not talking about halosaurs, because we don't know where they go. And so if we don't know where they go, we don't know whether they picked up on the, they have flippers like the other mosasaurs do. Um, but because we don't know where in this mess they fall, we can't do this tracing of where the flippers originated. Um, so that's why we're not talking about them. But we're now gonna zoom in back to where we started this, which is with Mosasaurus itself. So Mosasaurus is a Mosasaurine. Um, that group is a smaller group within the larger true Mosasaurids that is named for Mosasaurus. Um, they are extremely diverse um, in their anatomy, which we've already talked about. So for example, Dallasaurus, this is the little leggy guy um, that was found in Dallas, Texas. It's about 90 million years old. So it is quite a bit older than those Agiallosaurs. They're about 5 billion years older. It's very small. It's not much bigger than a regular monitor lizard. Again, huge still, but relatively small. And they've got Specifically, this animal preserves the hips that are attached to the spine. So that's how we know this thing had normal lizard legs. It didn't quite have flippers yet because we do not see flippers without first the evolution of the weirdo loose legs. These are also, in terms of diversity, everything I showed on this scale map is a Mosasaurine. So they range from the teeny tiny little Dallasaurus all the way up to literal sea monster Mosasaurus. Um, and then they also make up a large diversity of the teeth that I was showing you earlier, um, which means that they're preying on a large variety of animals in different ways. Um, we've even got one of them that's trying to be a tylosaurine, which like is fair because tylosaurs are the best, but we're here to talk about mosasaurs today. Um, and then you've got this thing. This is Plotosaurus. This is the one with the fish flipper. It's basically the farthest they got. Like we don't like to talk about evolution in terms of like progress or like ending in a pinnacle or anything like that, but Plotosaurus is basically the closest to a fish that these animals were able to achieve. Um, and then even within the same groups, so Prognathodon, which is the, the murder man that we talked about earlier, the other, one of the European species of Prognathodon actually has really skinny teeth. So it was likely eating something very different than its cousin in, in the US with, um, this one's actually Canadian. 
So that's what brings us to Mosasaurus itself, Mosasaurus hafmani. For reference, that's not a very big animal that I'm holding there. Like that's a solid medium sized Mosasaurus. Um, the skull would have been five and a half feet long. Um, that's about only the first two thirds of the jaw that I'm holding there. These ones have literally been found around the world, which I'll get to in a minute. Um, they're also very historic. So Mosasaurus was the first of these animals that was found and described. It was first found in Maastricht in the Netherlands in the 1760s. Um, the first specimen was 1760s. The second one, which is the holotype, so like the name bearing specimen that we use for reference here, was found in 1780s. So a bit of context, um, reptilia were named in 1758. A couple years later, we found Mosasaurus. Um, and Mosasaurus itself was named in 1822, so about 200 years ago, 20 years before the word dinosaur ever existed. Um, so this fossil was dug up in the Netherlands, and I, sh I should have added, there's, a, there's an old like uh, wood cutting drawing of people finding it in the mines. It's actually kind of cool. Um, it was found in the Netherlands, brought back to Paris, it's, or brought, yeah, brought to France. It's still on display um, in Paris in the Museum of Comparative Anatomy. Um, this is also the, Moses, the main mosasaur like, that if you, you can find in New Jersey in the creeks and things, like they're really big railroad spike teeth. It's Mosasaurus huffmani, sometimes called Maximus, um, and that's the skeleton that is hanging from the ceiling there, and that's the, it's that specimen, the jaw that I was holding in the other picture. Um, this specimen that's spinning here is a really cool one that was found in uh, Canada and Alberta. But they really are found around the world, so talking about Jormungand or the world serpent, this is literally the world serpent. Um, these things were, have been found around the Atlantic. Um, they were large marine predators, which we know today also cruise across the oceans and they don't localize themselves to just one place. Um, and this would have been an animal that was alive at the very end of the age of the, of the dinosaurs. It would have seen the asteroid. Um, and again, they are some of the largest individuals. To get back to Jormungandr, I'm happy to be able to talk about it this year. This is the critter that I hinted at um, last year. We got him published in um, this October or last October. Um, Yorgi was found in Walhalla, North Dakota. It's about 80 million years old. We know um, based on, I believe, the kind of like sediment that was present there that we actually have a good date that it was 80 million years old. Um, the specimen was collected over two years by the North Dakota Geosurveys uh, public fossil dig programs. It was actually first spotted by someone um, in a park who had been on one of those digs, so they knew what to look for. Um, they knew that they had a fossil, that they found a fossil, and they let the park rangers know, and then it was collected uh, by the survey. Uh, the specimen is a nearly complete skull and jaws. It's only missing the back part. Uh, we call that the brain case. Um, a couple of the delicate bones, like the eyeball bones, um, but the jaws are complete. It has the first 12 vertebrae, and it has a couple ribs. It also has some shoulder material, which we did not know about until after I submitted the paper and my co-author called me and said, hey, guess what I found? Um, so it's not in the paper, but we did upload those fossils to a website called Morphosaurus. So the spe specimen is completely um, open access. You can look at it, print it, spin it around, whatever you want to do with it. Um, if you find me later, I brought four hard copies of these. If you have a fun fact that you learned that you can tell me, I will give you one. Um, but this is what our boy looks like all put together. Obviously, we don't know the gender of it. We call it a boy because of the name, uh, but we don't know. <laughs> um, but this is what the skull looks like articulated. We 3D scanned every single bone, put it back together, and actually were able to 3D print the skull to go on display in North Dakota. Um, this is what our, how our artist drew the animal as it probably would have looked without being screwed up and squished and flattened by the ravages of time. Um, so we know uh, that Jormungandr is a mosasaurine that it belongs to the side of the tree that includes Mosasaurus. Uh, because it has this built-in angry eyebrow up here, that's a special feature that only Mosasaurines have. We don't know why, um, but they all have it. It also has some fun, confusing anatomy. So it was, a, it was a heck of a time figuring out what this thing was and eventually figuring out that we had a new critter uh, because it has a mix of traits that are seen in both early and later Mosasaurines. Um, so I'll get back to that later. Uh, but the other, another cool thing, last cool thing I'll talk about, which is what we included in our press art here. Um, same artist, Henry Sharp, he's fantastic. Um, it has bite marks on the neck. Surprise, you know, again, not, not surprising at all. These things hated each other. Uh, that said, we can't say whether that other animal actually killed our specimen or if it was scavenged. All we can tell is that the bites happened at or right after it died because they're not healed. They don't show any signs of healing also because they're on the underside of the neck vertebrae, which is hard to get at and not kill the thing that you're biting while doing that. Um, so 
Um, so back to Yorgi's uh, details here. So it has, like I said, like a weird mix of characters that initially caused quite a bit of trouble. We didn't know if we had one specimen or two because we found some bones that looked like Mosasaurus and some bones that looked like Clydastes. So Clydastes is the smaller bodied, kind of round flippered little guy. Um, the problem then also was that these two animals were not related to each other, Clydastes and Mosasaurus. Other than both being Mosasaurines, they were at the time separated by Prognathodon, Globodons, the Bubble Boys. So we thought, okay, maybe there's actually two specimens here. We have a Mosasaurus and we have a Clydastes. Then we found bones that had characters or traits of both other species on them together. So we know that that's not what we had. We actually had this transitional specimen. Um, and in addition to that, there were some features that made our specimen completely unique. Um, so first I'll talk about something that it has in common with Mosasaurus specifically. So basically what we're thinking is that this is a transitional form, a missing link between Clydastes, which is an early small Mosasaur, and Mosasaurus itself. Um, we know that it's related to Mosasaurus because it has this groove running along the teeth. So this is a, for a blood vessel or a nerve that would run along the bone. Um, it is present in, here's, here's our guy, here and Mosasaurus. It's here, completely absent in the other two guys here, Clydastes and Prognathodon. Um, it had though, it still had something, some things in common with Clydastes. It had this really skinny face, which more of a Clyd is more of a Clydastes thing. It has a lot of teeth. Um, so one of the bones, uh, Mosasaurs have three different kinds of bones that have teeth in them. They have the two normal bones, upper jaws, lower jaws. Wow, I did that backwards, oh well. Um, and they also have a double row of teeth on the top of their mouth, on the roof of their mouth. And that bone in Jormungandr had the same number of teeth as Clydastes, which is 16, and that's double the number of what we see in Mosasaurus. Um, but it had all these other things in common with Mosasaurus. And it was really this bone that helped us key in on the fact that this was a missing link. Uh, this is the frontal, this is like a forehead bone, and you're looking at it upside down, and the front is to the top. Um, Clydastes on the left, Yorgi in the middle, Mosasaurus on the right. And what we see happening here is two other bones that kind of come up around the eyeball under this bone. In Clydastes, they're separated from each other by this huge gap. In Mosasaurus, they touch each other. In Jormungandr, they're separated, but it's only by a little bit. It's only by this thin ridge. So we're approaching what's happening with Mosasaurus. And the cool thing is, is that this uh, pattern maps out in time as well. Clydastes is living 80 to 85 million years ago. Mosasaurus is living 75 to 66 million years ago. Yorgi is 80 right in the middle. So uh, this is what the Mosasaurine tree looked like before. Um, our guy, uh, and our guy wrought havoc. So uh, basically what we've done, what happens, or what this tells us is that actually the tree is wrong. Uh, what we've known so far, you know, is, is not actually an accurate representation of how these animals are related to each other. It turns out that Clydastes is cl more closely related to Mosasaurus than we thought. It's not quite as early as we once thought. That said, this doesn't necessarily mean that now Prognathodon and Globodons are more early or less advanced or anything like that. It just means that we're pushing the, the ancestor back a bit because those are really specialized animals and they are not found as early in time as Clydastes is. So we're probably missing whatever uh, critters gave rise to them. Um, but basically this go, is going to show that the um, evolution of this group in particular was a bit, more complicated, a bit more complicated than we thought, but also simultaneously not. It also goes to show the importance of a single specimen. This is one animal that we happened to find because someone happened to go on a fossil dig for fun one week in North Dakota and then happened to go on a walk in the park that day and happened to find that chunk of bone and happened to report it to the park rangers. So this is kind of getting at um, how lucky we are to know anything at all about the fossil record. So many things have to go right for the fossil to form, much less for someone to find it, recognize what it is, describe it, and publish it. Um, and all of these fossils are super important for answering these big picture questions, like how many times did these animals evolve? Which sounds like, an easy, like, sounds like it should be simple. What are they? Are they snakes or are they monitor lizards? I, again, I've leaned more the monitor direction, but the truth is I don't know. I'm happy either way. The point is we don't know, really. There hasn't been a slam dunk piece of evidence 
in my opinion, and more specimens like Jormungandr that are filling in these gaps will better help us to trace the evolution of the anatomy through time and give us a better, more complete understanding of lizard evolution in general. So to zoom back out about why mosasaurs themselves are important, um, first of all, there's a lot of them. So not as many as trilobites. I'm very jealous of the millions of specimens. We don't have millions, but we have thousands. Uh, which is pretty good um, for vertebrate fossils. So for example, T. rex, I believe, is only known from 30 to 35 good individuals. For mosasaurs, these are the numbers of specimens that I've seen myself. This is still not all of them, um, which is a lot. It's a lot more than 30, uh, but there's still a lot of museums I haven't been to. Um, and some of these groups, you know, I haven't seen quite as many of, but still a lot. And basically, this allows us to do um, statistics or ask questions with statistics with these animals because they have a high enough sample size where the pattern that we're seeing is likely to be a real pattern and not just an artifact. They have close living relatives. So unlike dinosaurs, mosasaurs anatomically are really, really similar to their living relatives. The problem with dinosaurs and other marine reptiles is that either, for example, other marine reptiles, we don't really know what they are. We know they're reptiles, but they don't have any living descendants or anything close. And with dinosaurs, their living descendants are birds, and birds are highly modified for flight. So we can't really do a one-to-one -one comparison. With a mosasaur, if you like put flippers on a Komodo dragon, it's basically the same. Stretch it out a little bit, regardless of what they're related to. Um, so that allows us to actually have a better understanding of um, questions that we can't actually test in mosasaurs themselves by studying uh, living lizards. So we can study the DNA of living lizards and we can also study their growth and development in real time. So this is something where um, there are a lot of labs working on lizard development. This is a gecko embryo that I worked on uh, during my undergrad. And because like Mark was talking about with Hox genes and developmental sequences, these patterns are really, really conserved. We can actually get a pretty good handle on, for example, how might a flipper develop from a lizard arm based on experiments that we can do in a real live lizard today. That's all things considered, not super different anatomically. Um, and the final reason that I think mosasaurs are important and fun to talk about is that they are fun to talk about. They're charismatic, which basically means they're really cool, um, which makes it fun for me to work on them and fun for me to talk about them. And it helps for people to be, uh, it helps people to be interested in the kind of science you're doing if you're working on cool animals and they have big scary teeth because, you know, it's fun. Um, and then now, of course, we've got the Jurassic World one, which like I don't care that it's inaccurate. It gets people aware of these animals and it gets kids to like them and have them be their favorite animals. And that's really you know, what matters. If it gets people to go to museums and learn more, it's a win in my opinion. So with that, thank you to everybody who has organized this event, to all the museums that have let me play with their bones. Um, and of course, the artists that have drawn the fantastic images in this talk. And I'll be more than happy to take questions. material to say that there is a fair amount of range between the size of the scales and say the species can you differentiate them based on the scales usually not because they're not common enough like a they're not common enough but b the the ones that have been identified are usually associated with some kind of bone so like the kansas ones that i know about are associated with some vertebrae so we know which one they are there is a specimen in la um, that's also a kansas specimen but it's covered in skin, but because we have the skeleton, we're able to tell what it is. There seems to be variation of scale type between different regions of the body based on that one specimen. Like we know a lot about it, uh, about them because of that one. Um, but it seems like it's a similar story um, as with the rest of their anatomy where they're all converging on tiny scale size with, um, they're usually diamond shaped and they usually have a little ridge running down the middle, which is really similar to shark skin and helps make them more hydrodynamic. Um, and the ones uh, from, it's from Morocco, is the one with the actual flipper outline. So that one has outlines of the flippers, and it's also, uh, it has an outline of the, the shark tail. So that's how we know they actually have that kind of shark-shaped tail. Yeah. 
Uh, the specimen of a uh, mosasaur in the New Jersey State Museum in Trenton, the one that's called Maximus. Yep. That's a photograph of you holding the jaw of it? Yeah, that, well, two thirds of the jaw. Okay, yes. And uh, in addition to that, that jaw, what other uh, material is preserved in that particular specimen and how much is reconstructed in the one shown in the museum? That's a great question. Um, that one is most of the skull and jaws and the first couple of vertebrae. Um, so the rest of it is based on its relatives that are a bit more complete in Europe. Yes, thank you. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, where is the Jormungandr holotype currently located? It is in Bismarck, North Dakota, at the North Dakota um, State Museum of, of History and, and Science or something like that. Yeah. You mentioned the loss of uh, sacral uh, fusions in the forms. Do you find a transitional series from like early mosasaurs that retained that kind of pelvic pearl fusion, or is it one of those more Abrupt, almost, uh, transitions it's it's more leaning abrupt um what we have basically is it's mosasaurines will have like there's like two or three vertebrae that are fused together but it's not like a sacrum sacrum like we see in a normal <laughs> a normal respectable animal um and then the hips themselves in the mosasaurines at least in the canadian material um the hip bones will be together. They're still kind of loose and they'll be kind of, you know, out of place. They're not, they're not attached to the spine, but they're attached to each other at the very least. Um, but that seems to be more of like just something that Mosasaurines kept as a consequence of being more ossified in the limbs in general. Um, but yeah. Yeah. Did the, the, the monitor lizard Mosasaurs, do they have a common ancestor, or is it that the Mosasaur evolved out of some species of the monitor lizard? That's a great question. The idea is that it's a common ancestor. So we don't think that Mosasaurs are descended from anything we have alive today, and they don't have any living descendants. Um, so the idea is that they shared a common ancestor with um, monitor lizards and the Borne Borneo earless monitor, which is not technically a monitor. Um, and them. And so also the idea with snakes, it's the same thing, where they last shared an ancestor with snakes that would have had legs, um, but they diverged into their, their own thing. Yeah. Yeah. Are there any plans to, um, you know, based on some of the newer information, to update the displays or text on the fourth floor? I think our fourth floor actually has it correct currently. Um, there's only two specimens so on the fourth floor at the American Museum. Um, there is a Tylosaurus and a Clydastes, um, and they are in the lizard zone. And I think that case actually has a discussion of the snakes or varanids. Um, and because it's still kind of up in the air, they don't have to, they don't have to change it, I don't think. And it doesn't change, um, Jormungandr doesn't like change Clydastes. Like Clydastes is still Clydastes, so they don't have to tinker with that. Yeah. Do mosasaurs seem to have a favorite food or just anything in It depends on the kind of mosasaur. So some of them did specialize on, on like favorite foods. So there were some that seemed to have liked squid more than anything. There are some that were primarily eating fish. Um, like Mosasaurus itself seems to have been a fish eater, which is odd given how big it got, but hey, you know, whatever. Um, and then things like prognathodon like almost always have like turtles or other mosasaurs, so they were favoring large reptiles. Um, and the bubble tooth ones that were eating hard shelled things, they were probably specifically going like for clams or for uh, ammonites, other things like that. And then other ones like Tylosaurus is the one that like, there's one specimen that has gut contents that include a bird, a fish, a plesiosaur, and another mosasaur, all in one animal. So like they weren't, they weren't picky. That one wasn't picky, but some of them were. Good question. Yeah. Uh, the original Charles Knight illustration in Jurassic Park notwithstanding, yeah. uh, there's no indication that these things had a mane or armor studs or anything like that on them. There's no, uh, no, we don't think so, because if they, if they had armor, there are enough good specimens that it would have preserved, like the little pebble uh, bones in that. We don't find that. Um, and the problem with like the, the fin, the dorsal fin kind of thing, we just don't have specimens that are good enough to tell. I would guess they wouldn't, but it's not impossible because it's a soft structure that might not preserve, but yeah. Um. Uh, there's some interest in if you've ever found a mosasaur which has any of their softer organs preserved, like showing the one with the fetuses. 
Yes, um, the one at the museum actually, at the American Museum, the Tylosaurus, if you look really closely, it has the trachea up under its skull, and then in the chest area, it's got actually the part of the trachea that's branching. So there's like a double row, because that's where it's going to the lungs. Um, and that one also has a bit of cartilage, like in the chest. So it, in, in the display, they're labeled as sternal ribs. Those are actually cartilage. And there's a, a cartilage part of the shoulder that's um, also preserved there, yeah. Is there evidence of protosaurs Pterosaurs, no, but pterosaurs are made of glass, and I wouldn't be surprised if they did and they just didn't preserve. Um, pterosaur bones are like literally less than paper thin, so like it's a miracle we find them at all ever. Um, they're relatively rare um, in the fossil record just because of that, um, even in Kansas, which is, we know they were living there, that's where Pteranodon is from, but they're always, if you see like the real fossils, they're like shattered because they're so delicate. Um, so I imagine if they were eaten by a mosasaur, they would be obliterated um, immediately. Um, dinosaurs, we don't have any evidence for yet. I wouldn't be surprised, though, if we do find one one day, uh, because something that is known to happen is dinosaurs will die near the beach and float out to sea. And I imagine mosasaurs were not picky, and they probably could have scavenged those. I don't envision them actually actively hunting dinosaurs, with the exception of birds. So I guess technically the answer is yes, because there's one that has a Hesperornis inside of it. Um, but like dinosaurs proper, I think they might have, they probably did like scavenge them if they floated out to sea, but I don't, they're not doing the orca thing to like go up on land and grab them. They're not that smart. <laughs> yeah. Um, so two questions. Um, one, uh, so I know that um, sometimes like um, in the present day, when you take uh, like fossils of like stuff like that, you would be like, oh, this is what like, um, artists might have thought it looked like um, from like the skeleton and it would be like completely different. So what's the, um, like how certain are you guys that uh, Mosasaurus look like? How did you the illustrations? We're pretty confident because like, like I've said, they're, they're just lizards. Like literally put flippers on a Komodo dragon and that's what they look like. Um, but like the, the real answer is because, because their skeleton looks so much like a modern lizard, like it helps. Um, that we actually know like what the muscles would have looked like, where they would have attached, how we would have drawn that. Um, on top of that, there are several really good skin impression fossils. Um, the ones with the actual body outlines are how we're able to tell the shape of the flippers. Um, so like the one in Morocco, um, it has the tail fin, which is cool, but we could have figured that out, and some people did based on the, the structure of the vertebrae. Um, so if you, if you look really closely at the one at the AM&H, the point at which the tail starts to curve down you'll see the tops of the vertebrae kind of like converge on each other. Like there's a shape change that happens there and that's a, that's a structural support for that tail fluke. Um, for um, other elements, like how chubby they might've been, a lot of the mistake of a lot of artists now though is that they see this large aquatic animal and they're like, oh, it's a whale. They're not, they don't have blubber like whales do. Um, lizards store fat very differently and these things probably were not as blimpy or chubby as, as a whale would have been. Um, ultimately just because they didn't have enough time to evolve that adaptation. So other marine reptiles like ichthyosaurs and plesiosaurs were around for like 100 million years. These guys were only around for 30. So like they were really only just getting started, which again, like given, given how short they were around for and how quickly they went from uh, Aegialosaur to Mosasaur. So like the earliest true Mosasaurs are 85 million years old. That's five million years after Aegialosaurs. Basically it's really insane how quickly they diversified. Um, but they didn't have time to change such a fundamental like physiological thing about themselves. Um, but yeah, beyond that, like we're very lucky to have a lot of really good fossils, but also the, the close living relatives. Cool. And then um, just the other thing was um, like, what's your favorite thing about Yorkie that you found? About Yorkie? Um, the bite marks are wicked. Like they're really fun. Cause like it's, it's an example where that's something where future study can be done on it to see uh, to CT scan the bone and actually see the internal anatomy of the bite and we can then better assess, okay, was this thing actually alive when it was bitten? Because the bone will have reacted in a different way. Um, I'd say that was really cool, but also I mean, the fact that it's like absolutely a new thing. Because a lot of times when, especially in mosasaurs, when you're trying to name a new species, the differences can be really subtle. And in this guy, it was like, oh my God, no, this is really you know, a different thing uh, that we get to use a cool name for. Um, which was not my idea, unfortunately, with my co-authors, but it's, it's you know, perfect. 
Um, and not about the specimen, but the other thing that I really did find out was um, the museum that this animal is held at has in their cultural hall a painting from a local resident, which is the, the Jormungandr painting that I showed at the beginning. And I texted my co-author, I'm like, did you know you had this in the museum? He's like, no. I'm like, oh, well, it's perfect. You know, it's meant to be. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. This is sort of like a shared question, but I mean, so you, you have some uh, creature that's become very adapted to being on the land. Mm -hmm. It applies to whales too, and then, then they go into the water. Is it just that there's food everywhere, or, or why are they able to make a spot for themselves and not be out competed by uh, things that have always been ocean dwellers? These things, so when this, when this happens, this invasion of an aquatic ha habitat happens, like you've said, it, it's happened over and over and over and over and over in, in amniotes. So amniotes are reptiles and mammals. You've got whales, sea turtles, seals, plesiosaurs, ichthyosaurs, mosasaurs, all these things are converging on the water. And they seem to coincide with, um, with opportunities of gaps in either other animals that have gone extinct, so they're able to fill in that and kind of just follow the resources. Like, it's likely that, like, and yet, like lizards today like to hang out by the water um, anyway, and if there's an opportunity for them to spend more time in the water, they might, they might, we, like, we might see the rise of mosasaurs again. Um, but uh, the origin of mosasaurs actually coincides with um, a time of productivity and changeover globally. So not just in the oceans, but also on land. So there's a higher, we find a higher number of like plankton and things in the sediments. And that translates to if there's more plankton, there's more fish. If there's more fish, there's more predators on those fish. There's more things that are feeding on that. Um, so for a while, it was thought that these guys beat out the other marine reptiles, but it really doesn't seem to be the case. It just seems to be that there's this new opportunity of productivity, um, and these things were in the right time at the right place. Um, and what's just really fascinating to me is then how quickly they went from you know Croatia to global, um, as even as like little little leggy guys. Can you do two more questions? Okay. Yeah. Is there a theory? Why sharks made it through the extinction at the end of the Cretaceous and Mosasaurus did because they were air breathing? And what's the thoughts on that? It could have been. I really have no idea. <laughs> like, it's, there's not often a way to predict what things are going to go extinct or not, you know, when, when these events happen. Because um, a lot of fish went extinct also. And so that doesn't completely explain it. And like when specifically like the, the KPG impact, the asteroid, um, that was a global um, disaster on a scale that I don't think most people can comprehend. Like I certainly can't. Um, the asteroid would have caused like basically no sunlight for years. And that would have killed so much of the, the phytoplankton, the other like primary um, photosynthesizing things that would have just cascaded upwards. So I really don't know. It might be because sharks are good at scavenging so they don't you know they kind of would benefit if everybody else is dying and they're not uh, but the catch with that is like the the acid rain and the ash and everything else caused by that impact would have poisoned a lot of the water anything in that vicinity would have been boiled alive or evaporated like instantly like it was horrific um, and on land at least we know that a lot of animals that made it through were burrowing so they were protected somewhat but in the water it's I think a bit more complicated um, but it's probably due to a couple of things like that. Um, sharks just seem to be real champs in terms of like making it through extinctions because they've made it through quite a few. Yeah. You had one photo labeled NJSM, is that New Jersey yes. State Museum? Yep. 